Hello and welcome to another episode of The Power of Story and Science. I'm your host, David Ode, and on this program we have a mix of content and conversations on how you can bring your subject matter to life by telling the story of your work. Today we're having a conversation. I'm pleased to have as my guest today Benedict Albensi, Ph.D., a professor whom I got to know recently at a scientific conference, and I was just fascinated with his interest in a variety of topic areas, some of which you're going to hear about today. Ben, hello. Good morning. How are you, David? Doing fine, thank you. Good to see you settling into your new office there. I know that you've recently relocated, so we'll possibly hear more about that. That's right. <laughs> um, ben, as he has given me permission to call him, is currently the chairman of the Department of Pharmaceutical Science in the College of Pharmacy at Nova Southeast University in Florida. Bit of a mouthful. Um, that's a change for him. He also has connections back in Winnipeg, Canada, including a lab he's still responsible for there. And rather than trying to rattle off a, a whole long list of credentials, I think I'll leave it there for now and let him tell you more. Um, I first uh, had the pleasure of getting to hear uh, Dr. Albensi talk about uh, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship in science. And the first thing I'd like to hear from you, Ben, is just a bit of how you got um, to where you are in, in science and your, and your interest in pursuing it with such passion. Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it does go way back to when I was a kid. And I think I was one of those nerdy kids that went to the library more than some of the other kids. And I had an interest in cell biology and electronics, and uh, I used to build my own radios and that sort of thing. And, and so I really would just kind of read books on my own. Um, you know, I mean, I did other things that, I grew up on the South side of Chicago. So I, I grew up in the city of Chicago and uh, those were turbulent times uh, during the sixties and seventies, but, um, but I made the best out of it. And in addition to going to the library and studying cell biology, we played street hockey and we did all those things that you do in, in an urban environment. But really I was interested in science for a really long time, but it, right before I went to college, um, I got interested in the arts. So I actually started out uh, my college career in art and photography. And I went to a lecture at Northwestern University in Chicago at the time. It was one of the requirements for one of the psychology classes I took. And I listened to a, um, a seminar by Dr. Orenstein, who talked about the mind and the experience of time. And I got so intrigued by this. I got so interested in the idea of the brain and neuroscience that I thought to myself, this is what I want to do. So I continued to do some stuff with art and photography, but I really just jumped into the deep end with academia. Uh, no one in my family had gone to uh, uh, graduate school or anything like that. I'm the first PhD in my family, but uh, so I, I got a degree and I went and enrolled in a program, uh, bachelor's in general science. And they didn't mm. have neuroscience in many schools at those days in the 70s and 80s. And so I created my own program. So sometimes, you know, some people that uh, were pre-med would do this sort of thing, but, but it really allowed me to combine my interests in biology, psychology, and physics into a program that we call general science. And it really set the stage for me to, for more advanced studies in neuroscience. So that's kind of how I got started in some of this. So that took place when you were an undergraduate. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. And so I, I then also got a master's degree. I did it on visual science. And then finally, I did enroll uh, in a PhD program. I got my PhD in neuroscience at the University of Utah, the medical school there, which was an interdisciplinary program. And it was pretty novel at the time. I was one of the first of five graduates uh, back in, uh, I got my degree in 95, but I started in 1991. Uh, so, you know, a, a really a true interdisciplinary program in neuroscience in, in that time. An interdisciplinary program in neuroscience. So that would have been uh, fairly, as you say, fairly novel for that time. I mean, neuroscience yeah. as, a, as an academic discipline hasn't really been identified by itself for that long, has it? It's really grown rapidly over the years. So I think in the 80s, some time around then the Society for Neuroscience formed and there were a couple thousand people that would go to the annual meetings. Uh, if you go to the meeting today, in fact, the meeting uh, was supposed to be in Chicago this month, but because of COVID, they had to change the format. 
typically they have about 30,000 people that go to the annual meeting now. So they'll have it at, they have to go to use the big convention centers because it is such a large gathering. So in San Diego, uh, sometimes in Toronto, Chicago, uh, Washington, DC. So only the large convention centers really can, can house a, a meeting with 30,000 uh, scientists. 30,000, wow, that is impressive. Now, in terms of neuroscience, you've done work in um, Alzheimer's, I believe you said? Yeah, that's right. So for the last 16 years or so, I've focused on Alzheimer's disease. Before that, I've really studied a memory for about 25 years now. And the last 16 years or so, I've really looked at memory impairment in Alzheimer's disease. That's been the focus. And I was in Canada for 16 years, uh, studying that in my lab up there. I'm an American, but I was up there uh, for about 16 years. My roots are actually in New Jersey and Chicago. So that's uh, where, I, where I grew up and, and my family lives and all that. Um, but I've been studying mechanisms of basic memory, normal memory for many years. So at what point did that morph into uh, an interest specifically in uh, pharmaceutical science? Because that's what you're doing now. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, things going on in the whole field of memory research and even Alzheimer's disease, but uh, I, I guess what always intrigued me were mechanisms of the brain and intelligence, and why are some people smarter than others, or why are some animals more intelligent than others? You know, this is always fascinating to me as a kid, and also the relationship of circuits. I was always interested in building radios and, and circuitry. And I, I kind of translated that to the circuits in the brain. So all of that really intrigued me, uh, how we have circuits in the brain and how these circuits can actually form memories and store memories. So all of that has been interesting to me and that's what I've been studying for many years now. <laughs> I'm beginning to understand now why, uh, just from a conversation that you and I had on the floor of a convention center, why there seemed to be such a connection. Because I've, I've also had broad-ranging interests, including, well, as an undergraduate, I double majored in radio, TV, film, and okay. physics. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and, and, and the, uh, the electronics courses that I took as part of my physics major, uh, that combined with my interest in broadcasting led to sort of an accidental career in broadcast engineering, because that was the, uh, uh, the best well, basically, I had a job opportunity. It was the best job opportunity I had to put myself through graduate school in broadcasting management. <laughs> so it was uh, eventually a training project in the broadcasting arena that led me out of television and into what I'm doing now, which is the speaking and, and training and, and coaching. Um, so it is interesting, I think, how sometimes interests combine in, in surprising ways. Yeah. Um, Tell me a little bit about this particular interest you have in innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and, and providing a, an atmosphere where scientists can develop those, those, uh, those practices. Yeah, so you know, I don't consider myself a traditional scientist because, and there are a lot of things I don't like about the scientific community, to be honest. I think, I think we have a lot of limitations, and many of these limitations are self-imposed. And one of the things I think that we're really lacking in science and medical education is, is creativity. And so we have lots of incremental research and there's a huge focus on critical thinking. And of course, this is, this is essential. We have to be critical thinkers and we have to analyze and we have to deduce and we have to pay attention and be rigorous. But, but it's almost as if the education system as we grow up, uh, they uneducate us in processes of creativity. So we're creative when we're little kids, but then the school system and, and, and just parenting, uh, you know, puts us in a position where we don't really follow up on those instincts and those processes of creativity that, that you know, make us who we are. And so I, I was always disturbed by that. And I always feel that scientists could be more creative, especially if they just took, uh, you know, certain measures to uh, change the way they look at life and at nature. To change the way they look at, you said, life and nature? That's right. Okay. And what would be the, the outcome of that? What, what different result would you expect if we weren't um, tamping down people's innate creativity through the education process? 
Well, I think if you look at the uh, Nobel laureates, for example, and if you look at the common denominator amongst those scientists that have really excelled over the years, there are a few different interesting features. I mean, these people and, and great thinkers haven't been just uh, bound to one particular discipline. They've had many interests and they've been able to connect their interests in unusual ways. And in fact, it's interesting to see how many Nobel laureates have been magicians in the past or have mm. been involved in the arts or are dancers or are musicians. And so it's really, you know, a variety of different thought processes and behaviors that I think contribute to who they are and to their creativity. And that creativity then is manifested in their scientific curiosity. Mm, so it, it's almost as if we need interests other than science or engineering, which is kind of my background, the very technical pursuits. We need something complementary to that, something artistic to help us bring out that other that other part of our thinking? I think so. And in fact, that lecture I was telling you about that I went to that really intrigued me about neuroscience and what changed my career direction talked about not only experience of time, but really the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And if you look at the that sort of regional uh, functionality of the brain, you, you learn that the left hemisphere is very uh, good and very dominant at mathematical thinking, logical thinking, where the right hemisphere is a more holistic process. It involves the arts, it involves music. And so it seems as if our, our education system, and, and sometimes we fall into these traps, where we're really stimulating that left hemisphere more so than the right hemisphere. And that was kind of what got me involved in really taking this direction of becoming a neuroscientist is understanding uh, those, you know, how the brain works and, and these different regions that allow us to do different types of uh, behaviors and thoughts and, and, you know, either perform math or perform uh, in the orchestra. I'm so glad you mentioned that because as you started down that road, I was thinking, I wonder about this whole left brain, right brain thing that you hear about in, in popular parlance, people talk about, you know, someone being left brained or right brained. Uh, and, and yet you've really looked into this from a neuroscientific standpoint. And, well, I did. And not there only really that, is a distinction I, there. I got a book many years ago. It was, it was called Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain. I've and heard of that I wasn't book. an artist at all at this time. And I bought that book and I really paid close attention to some of the techniques they introduced in this book. In fact, I took two or three days out of my schedule and I did nothing but read the book and follow the techniques. And so to make a long story short, I taught myself how to draw and I used the techniques and I learned how to stimulate some of those regions in my right hemisphere. And I, and, I, and it really worked for me. Um, and so not only was it interesting to me scientifically, but it really put me also in a position where I started getting, getting more interested in painting and the arts and music. And I had some, I had some background in music previously, but I had never really been involved in the, in the visual arts. And so it showed me that I could do it. And it showed me that it wasn't something that I, I necessarily had to inherit. I could actually train myself and teach myself. And then I also got other instruction on, on the outside uh, with watercolors and painting and, and that. And it really taught me how to use that other part of my brain that I think was being dormant for a while. What a fascinating experience. Now, you did say that as an undergraduate, photography was one of your interests. Right. Right. So yeah. you, you, there's always, uh, I suppose, I don't know about always, I don't want to speak for you, but it seems like you've had a, a long time interest in things visual. You said you weren't yeah. really into the visual arts like painting and drawing, but uh, you had a photographer's eye in any rate. Right. I think so. Yeah. And it's one of those things, my wife tells me I was born with a compass in my head. So I think, you know, visualization came uh, kind of naturally for me. Visualization came naturally. Okay. How has that influenced your work in science? Well, I think it's really a great, uh, you know, it's, it's very powerful to be able to visualize things in science and design of experiments and looking at outcomes and drawing up schematics, uh, even just creating uh, posters and slide presentations, you know, having that ability to think visually has helped in, in lots of different ways. And I think as a biologist or maybe as a, as a physicist, 
you know, we use those parts of our brain more than maybe some other disciplines to some degree, right? Oh, I, think I, Einstein was, I think Einstein was well recognized for his ability to visualize things that oh. he thought he thought more in, in images than he thought in, in words, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. And wasn't it Einstein who said imagination is more important than knowledge? I think he did. That's right. Hmm. I'd love to hear more from him about what he meant by that. Right. <laughs> um, so you were talking about this left brain, right brain uh, dichotomy. Through your work, have you become aware of ways that people can, I don't know, uh, I'm probably not using the right terminology here, strengthen the connection between those two? Well, that's an interesting question. And over the years, I, I, you know, I think that's how I got involved in neuroscience to begin with, but I didn't really follow that as, as deeply as I could have. But one thing I did learn many years ago is that in diseases like schizophrenia, there is a structure in the brain called the corpus callosum. And it basically, it's a fiber track that connects the left and right hemispheres. Mm -hmm. And apparently in diseases like schizophrenia and other conditions, those fiber tracks are not as well developed as you see in the so-called normal person. Really? So that's interesting to me. It almost as if the brain's not talking to each other. There's not as much crosstalk that, that is, as there should be. So I, I, don't, I never really followed up on that scientifically, but I remember reading that many years ago. And um, so my focus over the years really kind of uh, took me a different direction. Like I said, it really, I, I really went down the path of trying to understand memory and the way memories are encoded and stored um, and all those biological and genetic mechanisms that contribute to the storage of, of biological information. Getting back then to what you said earlier about how so many Nobel laureates have been uh, musicians, dancers, you know, people with interests in the arts. I think about dance, for example. I have a daughter who's a dancer. Mm -hmm. um, when people talk uh, commonly about muscle memory, is that a thing? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Uh, I, I, it could be. I mean, so if you look at this cellular level between neurons and muscle cells, there's actually a lot of uh, a similarity. So they're both excitable cells. And, and so if there's something called an action potential, and basically it's the biochemistry behind the neurological firing, right? So cells okay. fire, mm -hmm. they have electricity, there's current uh, exchange, there's ions that flow from one side of the membrane to the other. So because of that, there's actually a lot of similarities between, especially like heart cells uh, uh, and, and neurons. Okay. So they're both excitable cells because of that, you know, there's a lot of similarity. You know, they do different things, but there are different forms of memory. In fact, there are dozens and dozens of different types of memories, right? So we have dozens emotional dozens. memory, we have okay. short-term memory, there's intermediate memory, there's long-term memory, there's registration memory, there's uh, you know, working memory. So all of these are, are not only different forms of memory, but really um, they exist in time dependent stages. So it gets very complicated and it does take a while to explain the forms and the stages of memory. Interesting. Now I've often heard that when people, I, I hear this often as a complaint, you know, that they're, they, whoever they are, are, uh, people responsible for public education, for example, are taking too much of the arts out of public school curriculum and focusing too much on, on STEM-related subjects, science, math, um, to the detriment of people's learning because there's a, a popular view that um, being good in music and developing mathematical skill are linked. Do you see that? I do see that. Now, I'm not an educator at the grammar school level, and those people are expert in what they do, and I don't pretend to be an expert uh, in those areas with education science. But, but from a biology point of view and a psychology point of view, I think that is true. And in fact, with my own kids, I, I want them to be exposed to the arts, to, to music, and to painting and drawing in order to make them better engineers and scientists, right? I, I, so, I mean, they don't have to become a scientist or engineer for me to be happy, or it's not something I'm pushing them into. But I, I think that, I think it's often neglected. 
especially if you see the competitive the competitiveness that we have with trying to get our kids into medical school or into certain engineering programs or the top 20 schools you know we i think we are uh neglecting uh supporting and reinforcing other behaviors and parts of the brain that that could really you know overall contribute to their success that could that contribute sense. to their success sure um so you say you haven't really focused your research on uh, what you read about regarding the corpus callosum. I've, I have found that interesting, too. I have a family member uh, whom we recently lost, unfortunately, uh, who had uh, experienced uh, throughout pretty much his entire adult life, uh, for, for more than 40 years, he experienced uh, schizophrenia. And I had not heard that connection before that that could be related to um, sort of, as you say, I think kind of an underdeveloped corpus callosum and the, the two hemispheres not working well together. And um, I, I think it's interesting that you've got this intersection of, of interest there that even though that's not the area of the brain that you've researched specifically, you, you look at all these different kinds of memory and, uh, and, and how we have to really develop them in, in terms of developing different skills, I guess, to be, what, whole-brained? <laughs> Would that be a thing? Well, if you look at the current Alzheimer's research, it's, it's clear at this point that um, mental activity and to some degree your level of education is correlated with your risk for dementia. So that, that's clear. The evidence is clearly showing that. Now, no, whether I'm, or not... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but let me just make sure I'm clear on what you just said, that yeah. Um, the, the correlation goes how? That the, your level of education and, and also level of uh, like uh, a, a job or a career that's mentally demanding. Mentally demanding. Correlated okay. uh, inversely with your risk for dementia. Okay, so correlated have, inversely it, with the risk of dementia. That's right. If you, if you have a job that's intellectually demanding, these seem to be working in your favor for reducing your risk for dementia. I right. see. Okay. A, a <laughs> to put it crudely, sort of a use it or lose it type of thing. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And maybe that's where muscle memory comes in to some degree. I mean, muscles can be think thought of that way: use it or lose it. Right. Right. So it's similar in that sense too. So the more um, sort of uh, I don't know that intellectual is the right word, but the more mental stimulation you've experienced over your life the less your likelihood of dementia. That's right. And there are genetic risk factors that we're all uh, at risk for. But, um, you know, a lot of the evidence I've been seeing the last 15 years or so really points to uh, the genetic component being pretty low. I mean, we, as we learn more about new genes, that maybe those numbers will go up. But really, about 90% of dementia is environmentally linked. Right. Really? Okay. Ninety percent of it. Factors. But okay. that number could change as we learn more too. I see. It is certainly a developing area still. A lot That's to learn. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the few minutes we have left, I'd like to circle back to your your interest in innovation and creativity. What are some of the ways that you are or, or people you know are encouraging more uh education and experience for people in science or for people who are pursuing uh, science as, as students, graduate students? How are you encouraging more innovation and creativity? Well, there's a number of things that we're trying to do at our university that I try to do as an educator, as a teacher, or that I might do in the lab with my trainees. I mean, I can give you one example. I had a class once where I taught introduction to neuroscience. And um, I had a weird audience in the sense that I had undergraduates and graduates. I had pre-med students and I had engineers. And so how do you deliver uh, a topic to such a you know diverse audience, right? Right. Uh, and so what I did is that I, I learned a little bit about so-called multiple intelligence theory. Okay. And basically that there's different learning styles, there's different you know, things that people are more inclined to get, be good at. I created a test with eight different modules and, um, and I asked them to, when they, it was time to give them a test to, uh, 
that they had to take five of the modules. So one would be on sketching, one would be on problem solving, one would be essay questions, another one is multiple choice. So I tried to give them an opportunity to use, uh, you know, uh, techniques and, and kind of their way of thinking uh, in order to be tested on. So I could test their performance based on what they were good at rather than just doing it one way. I mean, that's just an you know, educational tool I was trying to develop. I think there's other things too, though, in the laboratory. This is some of the things that we brought out at that panel that we were on, that you attended. Uh, what can we do with our, our trainees? How can we encourage them to think creatively? Because they've been through this school system where they've been told exactly what to do. And then they get to the graduate level where they're working on their PhD and now they have all this freedom and they don't always know what to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. They're so used to being told what to do. So that's the challenge that we have and, um, and that we try to talk about in the panel. So it, it's tough to try to just throw a switch overnight and expect people to be creative in the laboratory when the last 10 years or 15 years or so They've been and you know uh, practicing other behaviors. Practicing other behaviors, right? Okay, meaning uh, demonstrating their ability to master specific algorithms or give certain answers on tests. That's right. Regurgitating what they learned in a textbook, rather than asking probing questions, rather than trying to come up with a new idea. Um, so those sorts of things, and you know, it, it would take a while to explain some of that, but. Right, right. Well, and, and as you say, you're, you're not an educator, uh, and yet so many of your, well, you're not a, uh, a primary level educator. You are a, certainly a, an educator at the graduate level. Um, we'll, we'll perhaps have that discussion another day with a, another expert. That's one of the things I love about doing this program. <laughs> um, as, we, as we move toward wrapping this up, uh, Van, is there one thought that you would want to leave my viewers and listeners with regarding uh, how they how they uh, in, encourage creativity in their communication, perhaps? In their communication, that's an interesting question. So I, I think that perhaps you talk about this in some of your books, to be a listener as opposed to having uh, 10 or 12 things that are on, on the tip of your tongue that you want to talk about, you know, to, to open your mind and be receptive and spend more time listening rather than preparing for the, the next thing you want to put forward. I think those are the sorts of things that, that opens up your mind to more effective communication. Well, thank you for that. And, and thank you for the, uh, the, the plug for my book. I'm glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of plugs, uh, how can people follow up with you? Yeah, so you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, Benedict Albensi. I think I'm pretty easy to find if you just put in my full name on LinkedIn or my email address, blbensi at nova.edu uh, would be another way you could contact me. All right. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for taking time to be with me on the power of story and science. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you. Yeah, thank you, David. Very nice seeing you again. And for all of my viewers and listeners, thank you for being part of the Story and Science community. If you want to follow up with me, uh, you can go to storyandscience.com, and that will take you to the homepage for this program. 